Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the March 1st Spokane City Council meeting. We're in order. Uh, Madam Clerk, if you could read the roll. Council President Beggs. Here. Council Member Burke. Here. Council Member Cathcart. Present. Council Member Kinnear. Present. Council Member Mum. Here. Council Member Stratton. Here. Council Member Wilkerson. Present. Let the record reflect that all council members are present. All right, we have uh, two proclamations tonight. The first one's for the American Red Cross, and Councilmember Cathcart's going to read that, and we have Ryan Rodden here to accept it. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> whereas, in congruence with the tradition of recognizing and celebrating the service provided to the people of the United States of America, by the American Red Cross, which was instituted by Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1943 and continued by our nation's leaders today. And whereas throughout its 105 year history, the American Red Cross serving the greater inland Northwest has supported the needs of the citizens of this community by providing critical aid to victims of disasters, from home fires to windstorms, teaching tens of thousands the skills that save lives, providing international connection services, and supporting service members, military families, and veterans through outreach and engagement activities. And whereas the American Red Cross, through its dedicated network of volunteers, donors, and partners, will continue to respond to challenges at home and abroad with compassion and generosity, ensuring that help and hope is available to all who turn to the Red Cross during their time of need. Now, therefore, I, Nadine Woodward, mayor of the city of Spokane, on behalf of the citizens of Spokane, do hereby proclaim March 2021 as Red Cross Month. And I will turn it over to Ryan to accept. Great. Thank you, council members. I appreciate you taking a moment to read our proclamation. Um, I'm Ryan Rodin, the executive director of the Greater Inland Northwest Chapter. And as <clears throat> Council Member Cathcart said, um, March is Red Cross Month. And last year I was in the, uh, the council chambers accepting this in person. And obviously a lot has happened in that year uh, with the pandemic, with wildfires and windstorms. And I just really appreciate you recognizing the efforts of our volunteers, all of our response, uh, 90 plus percent of what we do at the Red Cross is led by our volunteers. And so it just, it means a lot that you would recognize their efforts uh, today and for the entire month of March. And we just appreciate being a part of Spokane and the Eastern Washington community and we'll continue to be here for our neighbors whenever disaster hits. So thank you very much, I appreciate it. All right, thank you Ryan for all, um, thank you Ryan for all that you do and your organization. And the next proclamation is disability awareness and council member Mum is going to read that and I see John Lemus on the line and also potentially Katrina Boyk, but I'll turn it over to you, Council Member Mum. You're on mute. I need to unmute so you can hear it. How's that sound? City of Spokane Proclamation. Whereas an intellectual or developmental disability affects more than 7,000 people in Spokane County and their families, and public awareness about the needs of people with developmental disabilities can help Spokane become a more welcoming city. People with developmental disabilities are a vibrant part of our community, improving the quality of life for all of us. And whereas the month of March has been designated Developmental Disabilities Awareness Month by a 1987 presidential proclamation, and whereas it is the goal of the 21st century workforce, the City of Spokane's Supportive Employment Initiative, that the employee demographics for the city also reflect the community we serve. Now, therefore, Nadine Woodward, the mayor of the City of Spokane, on behalf of the citizens of Spokane, does hereby proclaim the month of March 2021 as Developmental Disabilities Awareness Month. 
and urges all citizens to give full support toward enabling people with developmental disabilities to live a full and productive life of inclusion in our community. So Mr. Lemus or Ms. Boyk, would you like to um, tell us a little bit about what's happening this month? Thank you, Councilwoman Mum. Um, my name is John Lemus and I'm the advocacy coordinator for At Work. Um, this month, we will have several buildings in Spokane lit up orange um, in honor of Developmental Disabilities Awareness Month. Um, tonight, we had a great kickoff event hosted by the Ark of Spokane, um, and families and individuals got to enjoy that. Um, I just want to say a few words personally. Um, I very much appreciate the proclamation and um, the recognition of IDD Awareness Month. Um, this month is all about individuals with IDD and the amazing things that they are doing in their communities. Um, and a lot of them are doing great things and we're bust, busting the odds that say that we can't. Um, we've got people working in the community. We have people living in the community, um, being great productive citizens in their communities. And um, I hope to see that for many years to come. I want to thank their city, the city for their commitment to the 21st century workforce, um, especially the supported employment program. Um, I put a lot of effort into fighting for that as a human rights commissioner and am happy to see that um, come to fruition. So thank you all. Thank you, John. It's great to see you again and hear about your work. Uh, keep it up. Appreciate that. All right, we have a um, two reappointments and one appointment. Um, Madam Clerk. Council Member. <clears throat> two, oh, sorry, wait. Board. I'm sorry. Council Member Wilkerson, you had a point of personal privilege you would like to express. Uh, thank you so much. I just want to say thank you to Spokane for those who supported Black History Month. It culminated on this weekend. We had 537 people ride the gondola ride in COVID modified procedures. Downtown was just bustling with youth. It's just a celebration. And I want to say what was so striking, how many of the people who live here who said they had never had the opportunity to take advantage of a gym in our city. So I just want to give a shout out to America Credit Union, Downtown Partnership, HBPA, Hispanic Business Professional Association, and the Carl Maxey and our own parks department. So thank you, Spokane. There's more to come. I appreciate it. All right. And we also had some uh, African flags up on the light poles and some lighting in the park. It was uh, very festive and like nothing we have ever seen, I don't think, in Black History Month. So it's pretty cool. Um, all right. Madam Clerk, we have some reappointments and an appointment. Okay. Reappointment of Kenneth Hall and Sarah O'Hare to a three-year term on the Ethics Commission from January 1, 2021 to December 31, 2023. An appointment of Catherine Alexander to a three-year term of January 1, 2021 to December 31, 2023 on the Community Housing and Human Services Board as the Community Assembly Representative. All those in favor of making those appointments indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed nay? All right, congratulations folks. Thank you so much for your work. And again, if you're interested in serving on one of our many boards and commissions, uh, you can contact the mayor's office. Uh, you can see what the current boards and commissions are and when um, current members spots are expiring by just searching the city's webpage. So thanks so much for that. Uh, now let's move to our legislative agenda. Resolution 2021-13, setting a hearing before the City Council for April 12, 2021, for the vacation of the alley between Columbia Avenue and Joseph Avenue from the east line of Julia Street to the west line of Myrtle Street, as requested by Dan Cantu. And we don't have any public comment on it. Um, Eldon, I always appreciate hearing from you on this and getting it into my mind what's going on. So if you'd like to take over the screen for a moment and... Tell us what's going on. Yeah, yeah thanks, Council President Biggs. Let's see if I can pull up this map here. Okay. 
Can everybody see that? We can. Thank you. Yeah, what the applicant wants to do is vacate this alley between Julia and Myrtle from Columbia to Joseph. And basically, as you can see, it's about 80% undeveloped. And the applicant wants to build a, an indoor, indoor training facility in this area using the alley. We have no city utilities in that alley. And the one developed property also supported the petition. They signed it. But anyway, they would like to vacate that alley so they can actually build over, build this facility. And I think this and Comcast have some facilities in there that we need to address as part of the vacation. But beyond that, it looked like a good candidate to vacate. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Eldon? All right. One thing, I forgot, one thing I forgot to mention here, they, this was platted in the time of the non-user statute. So they are looking at uh, vacating this as a no-cost vacation using that statute. So. Okay. Thanks for letting us know that. Um, any council commentary or questions? All right. I'm not hearing. I, we're screen sharing, so if, if you go ahead and volunteer. Um, hearing none, again, this is just to set the hearing, and so we'll have a roll call vote. Um, Council Member Mum. Aye. Council Member Stratton. Aye. Council Member Kinnear. Aye. Council President is an aye. Council Member Burke. Aye. Council Member Cathcart. Aye. Council Member Wilkerson. Aye. All right. That passes seven to zero. I'm going to take a quick uh, commercial break here. So if we've had people sign up for open forum and um, legislative testimony, but of the five people who signed up for legislative testimony, I'm only uh, seeing one that actually said they wanted to testify on something, and we only have two people on the phone currently. So if you, if you did sign up uh, to testify, I'll, I'll say what you're, who signed up to testify. So open forum is Nicolette Ockeltree, uh, Drea Rose Gallardo, and Alyssa Johnson. And then on legislative, um, legislative testimony, several people signed up, but again, only one of them sort of made it on the sheet. And so we'll check in with you in a little bit. But Hansel, Sanchez, Anna Trustee, again, Nicolette Ockeltree, who has a yes on it, Fernanda Mazco, and Ryan Louie. Um, so all the, Hansel, Anna, Fernanda, and Ryan, we didn't have you actually signed up on anything. Um, but we'll, when we get to that, I'll call your name. Council President? Yeah. I'm pretty sure they wanted to do open forum. Okay. All right. That's helpful. I'll... But if you do want to testify, please um, be on the phone and remember that we have a pretty significant um, uh, delay between the video and the phone. That's why it's important to be on the phone. So if you did sign up, make sure you're on the phone. And when I get to the police guild, uh, I'll see if there's anyone other than Nicolette who wants to testify. Anyway, thanks for that digression. And then now let's go to the next uh, resolution. Resolution 2021-14, declaring Nalco Chemical Company a sole source provider of conditioning chemicals and associated equipment for use in the high-pressure boilers and steam system at the Riverside Park Water Reclamation Facility and authorizing the purchase of conditioning chemicals and associated equipment from Nalco Chemical Company for $332,800 plus tax and shipping without public bidding for a five-year term. All right. Again, we didn't have any uh, requests for public comment. Uh, is there any council commentary or questions? All right, seeing none, we'll have a roll call. Councilmember Mum. Aye. Councilmember Stratton. Aye. Councilmember Kinnear. Aye. Council Presidents and I. Councilmember Burke. Aye. Councilmember Cathcart. Aye. Councilmember Wilkerson. Aye. All right, that passes seven to zero. Gets us to an ordinance. 
Ordinance C-36013, amending Ordinance C-31697 that vacated Medelia Street from the North Line of Fairview Avenue to Euclid Avenue except North Foothills Drive and the alley between Medelia Street and Pittsburgh Street from Fairview Avenue to Euclid Avenue except North Foothills Drive. And Eldon, if you want to tell us about that. You're still there. I'll try to blow this one up a little bit here. Yeah, basically what we're trying to do on this one is release an easement in this crosshatched area for some 75 foot wide easement. We can't see it, Eldon. We can't see the map, actually. We can't see the map here. Yeah. <clears throat> Hold on just a second here. And we'll try this again. Now, can you see it? Yes. What we're trying to do on this one is actually release an easement there where it says 75 foot wide easement on an original vacation we had from the Bailey Street, but reserve an easement down here on this little triangular piece next to North Foothills Drive where we do have a storm sewer in there. So the goal is to actually amend the original easement to release the crosshatched area, large crosshatched area, and then the smaller triangular area down there is reserve a, a separate easement for a storm drain in there. So we're just trying to uh, amend the original ordinance to accomplish those two things. We do have a sanitary sewer manhole also right there where my hand is. We're actually relocating out here into North Foothill Drive, and we can then turn this piece of sewer into a private sewer. So that was just another aspect of accomplishing these various items here. So I'd be happy to answer any questions about it. Any questions for Eldon? All right, not hearing any. Um, didn't have any requests for public comment. So we'll have a roll call. Councilmember Mum. Aye. Councilmember Stratton. Aye. Councilmember Kinnear. Aye. Council Presidents and I. Councilmember Burke. Aye. Councilmember Cathcart. Aye. Councilmember Wilkerson. Aye. All right. Passes seven to zero. I'm Hoping all these easements that are freeing up land are going to lead to building houses. So we'll, uh, uh, we'll see if that works. And we have one more uh, ordinance kind of related on the same topic. Ordinance C36009, amending Ordinance C16202, vacating 3rd Avenue in the city of Spokane from the west line of A Street to the east line of Audubon Street and vacating 10th Avenue from the west line of Julia Street to the east line of Rebecca Street to release unnecessary easements that encumber property deferred from February 22nd, 2021 agenda. All right. Um, Eldon, one more time, and then, then you can go home. <laughs> Everybody see this one? Yes. Okay, we talked about this one last week a little bit. And what we had here originally it was a crosshatched area that used to be 10th Avenue that got vacated back in the 50s. And when it was vacated, there was a 30 foot wide easement in there that was actually an access to a city plant, which I don't exactly have figured out exactly what it was. But we retained an easement through there at that time. When we did that, we actually ended up landlocking a couple of parcels in there and that's i did a little checking on there that's really not against state law but it's certainly something we don't try to do in this day and age we don't really like to landlock parcels but i'm sure people checked at the time they were doing this and probably the parcels on uh, both sides of 10th avenue on there were owned by the same parcel owner with the idea that at such point in time as the vacation occurred they would try to aggregate those because we don't have any control over that process once the uh, uh, 
streets vacated when you've got properties on both sides of the street, then we're just up to the property owners to go ahead and finish off an aggregation. Well, they did not do that. So we do have two landlocked parcels. I thought a short plat right here where my hand is located in there was going to have some effect on that. But primarily what happened there is this area that I'm kind of outlining with a hand is in the do a short plat. And because they got that 30 feet of property there that's in the crosshatch in their parcel, that is allowing them to actually turn that lot into two lots in there so they can actually build a second lot on there if we release that easement. I know there's some concern about that last week when we talked about it on there, but uh, primarily that old easement was just serving the city plant, which is no longer there. So I think from our staff end originally, we just thought that it was a useless easement at this point in time and just made sense to actually release it. But I wouldn't be happy to answer any questions about it, but we are processing the short plan in here that actually now can turn this into two lots facing out to Julia Street because they do have that 30 feet of right away and they're just trying to un unencumber that 30 feet that has that easement on it to build a house. I'd be happy to answer any questions about it. Yep, any questions? All right, no public commentary. So let's have a roll call. Councilmember Mum. Aye. Councilmember Stratton. Aye. Councilmember Kinnear. Aye. Council President Sinai, Councilmember Burke. Aye. Councilmember Cathcart. Aye. Councilmember Wilkerson. Aye. All right. That passes seven to zero. We have two things left tonight. Um, one is the special consideration of the police contract, and then we also have a special consideration of a potential letter on vaccines. Because we don't have many people signed up, uh, I'm inclined to go to the police contract since we have the mayor and several staff on that. And then we'll maybe we'll take a short recess if people need to, to look over the latest draft of the letter on vaccines that Shay sent out just a few minutes ago. So uh, let's go to the special consideration, Madam Clerk. S1, approved 2017 to 2021 police skill tentative agreement. All right, that's a very short title, Mayor, but uh, it's been a lot of work. So uh, <laughs> thank you. We're so pleased to uh, have you here this evening, and I know that we're going to hear from you and uh, Chief Meidel and uh, Chief Financial Officer Wallace, and I believe we have our lawyer on standby if we need her, but we don't necessarily need to hear from her. So I'll turn mm -hmm. it over to you, Mayor, and your cabinet, and we'll take it from there. All right. Well, good evening, Council President, members of the Council tonight. Um, to those who are also joining us virtually, it's, it's our pleasure to present a five-year contract with the Spokane Police Guild that came together uh, through a very collaborative negotiation that saw everyone heard. Uh, those of us giving a little, reaching an agreement that complies with the city charter and gets us moving forward again. So this contract meets the dual needs of the community to show support for its police officers and also to gain greater clarity on civilian oversight. Spokane Police Department has been a leader in police accountability and reform. And this is a result of that continued leadership and willingness to honestly evaluate how our officers can better serve this community. And the financial and working conditions of this contract are fair to the officers and the community that they serve. And we did things uh, rather differently than we have with previous negotiations to get to this point. I personally got involved at the table this past summer at the invitation of the Guild and Council President Beggs, you have also joined me at the table for several of those conversations. And I can't overstate how important it was to get everyone around the same table. It was the best way to move forward past the um, disappointment that we all felt last summer. That disappointment, as painful as it was, was really an opportunity to hear each other out and to really listen to each other. And those conversations weren't easy. They were difficult, honest, raw, hard, but we all learned a little more about each other and where everyone was coming from. So I give 
all the credit to the Spokane Police Guild for being open to trying something that was new and for being willing to have these discussions because getting everyone together in one place was their idea. They invited that conversation and were willing to try something new and it worked. So my personal thanks and appreciation to Chris Honecker, John Griffin and the other guild negotiation team members, also to you, Council President Beggs and to the council for trusting me and trusting our relationship enough to be at the table every time we asked you to be there, which was a lot. And um, it took all of us working together to get this done. So I have asked Tanya Wallace, our chief financial officer to join me tonight to briefly go over the terms of this contract and also Chief Craig Meidel to talk quickly about what turning the page on this contract means to the police department. So Tanya. Uh, thank you, Mayor Woodward. As the mayor mentioned, the contract is for five years. It is retroactive to 2017 and runs through the end of this calendar year of 2021. The length is a year longer than proposed this past summer. The total cost of compensation, which includes salary enhancements for specialty assignments and benefits is equal to an annual 3.5% for each of the five years of the contract. The total cost of the multi-year guild contract estimated to be nine and a half million will be paid for out of both the 2021 operating budget approved by the city council in December and general fund unappropriated reserves. The amount coming from reserves is for the retroactive pay for years 2017 through 20, 2020. Those dollars were budgeted through the regular annual budgeting process the administration and city council goes through and have been set aside during the previous years in anticipation of a new contract. So we can certainly afford what is being proposed to you and have stayed within that affordability. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Council President Beggs, council members, thank you very much for giving me a couple minutes to speak tonight. Um, this has been a long process. And I believe we all would overwhelmingly agree that this process produced a better product because of the collaboration between all of the parties that were involved. I'm thankful that our community and the department will now be able to move forward with the certainty and the clarity that this contract provides. The men and women of our department have worked for a long time without a contract, and I am proud of the professionalism, the dedication, as well as the commitment that they have served this community with unwaveringly. With the settling of this contract, I know the men and women of the Spokane Police Department will feel a bit of the burden lifted from what has been a very challenging year for all of law enforcement. Additionally, I believe this contract will increase our recruiting efforts and bring us more in line with our contemporaries. Law enforcement across the nation is competing from the same pool of candidates for highly motivated and highly ethical uh, people who want to be police officers. And I anticipate that this contract will make us that much more competitive and that will allow us as a police department to serve the community better as well. So thank you very much for your consideration tonight. Thank you. And council members, if you have any questions for the mayor, the chief, or for CFO Wallace, um, now would be the time. So. All right. I'm not seeing any. Thank you again, uh, all of you, for being here tonight, but really for all the work uh, for several years, uh, especially Chief Meidel. It's been many, many years you've been working on this project. I appreciate that. Uh, we have one person um, definitely signed up, and that's Nicolette Ockeltree. And if you're there, Nicolette, if you want to hit star three. All right, Nicolette, go ahead and introduce yourself. You have up to three minutes. I'm Nicolette Ockeltree. In 2019, an overwhelming majority of Spokane citizens voted for open and transparent collective bargaining negotiations. As such, Section 40 of the Spokane Charter states, as of December 1, 2019, the City of Spokane will conduct all collective bargaining contract negotiations in a manner that is transparent and open to public uh, observation, both in person and through video streaming playback. The TA with the police guild you're voting on today was not negotiated in accordance with that section of the charter. 
Lawyers likely argued about whether or not these negotiations were a continuation of the same negotiations that started in 2017, but common sense will tell you that after the last contract was rejected, a new negotiation began. Even new participants were brought to the table to negotiate this time. Mayor Woodward and City Council President Beggs, um, as we just heard from Mayor Woodward, things were done differently this time. Um, I don't really care what the lawyers concluded uh, when they were done arguing about uh, this fact. It's undeniable that closed-door negotiations of this contract violated the spirit of the vote of the citizens, since many of us voted for transparency and open negotiations precisely for this very reason. Uh, Section 129 of the Spokane City Charter says the city shall not enter into any collective bargaining agreement that limits the duties or the powers of the OPO as set forth in the Section 129. And yet, the TA um, uh, that, we're, that we're considering tonight, uh, in it, the Police Guild's collective bargaining agreement does limit the duties and powers of the OPO and flies again in the face of Spokane citizens' uh, vote for police oversight. That's two votes that this uh, violates. Um, in the uh, TA Article uh, 27E1, the OPO um, is allowed only to refer complaints to the internal affairs for conduct within one calendar year, which shouldn't be a restriction, and will uh, tell the complainant that they cannot guarantee internal affairs will investigate the complaint. Now, remember, internal affairs investigation complaints are the only ones that can result in uh, discipline, um, nor can they tell the complainant that the OPO has sufficient resources to conduct independent investigation, which is their job. So they have to tell them that they cannot guarantee that they will do their job. Uh, this requirement not only limits the duties and powers of the OPO, a violation of Section 129 of the Charter, but also strong arms to a complainant and citizens into choosing mediation, which, if done in good faith, cannot result in disciplinary, act disciplinary action. Uh, during mediation, horrific misconduct could come out and still no disciplinary action could be taken. Uh, this is not a consequence that it upholds fairness and justice, and it makes a mockery of the system and the votes of the citizens. Article 27, F1 of the TA says that the OPO uh, can't interview any officers in preliminary investigations of a complaint unless the complaint was made by an officer, which calls into the question whether or not the OPO has the power to compel a statement from officers under Garrity versus New Jersey. That's, um, that's three minutes, violations. Nicolette. That's, Thank you. That's three minutes. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. And again, there were several people who possibly signed up, so I'm just going to read out your name and if you're one of those people and you're on the line and you wanted to testify in the guild contract hit star three so that would be hansel sanchez anna trustee fernanda mazco ryan louis um if i don't hear from you i'm assuming you want to be on open form and i'll call your name when we get to that all right, we're not seeing any indication of that. That brings uh, to a close public testimony on this. Um, and I'll open it up to council commentary. Councilmember Mum. Uh, thank you. Um, I want to thank uh, all the leadership that was involved to get us to this TA. Uh, we did find a better way this year, I think, than we ever have before. Council in the past has been shut out and not included and not at the table uh, and really got it at the very end of the process, despite what uh, the public and media believed, we weren't part of it. And I think it shows that when council is involved, we come out with a better product. And so I, I want to thank all of those who included um, council president and um, some of us uh, with um, the the council who were involved in some of the early discussions. We did hear from our community throughout, even though we've had very little public testimony tonight, we certainly heard from the community. We had more emails on this and contacts during the pandemic of any issue I've seen in eight years. We heard from all different walks of life um, and you know, people had their feelings about it, very emotional. Um, you know, obviously we had demonstrations in the streets about other issues that were brought to light. But I do believe we can support police and support oversight at the same time. And that's what I think this contract does. And I also wanna say this council has repeatedly 
supported funding our police and has demonstrated that public safety is a priority. So I am happy to support this PA tonight. Thank you. Other council members? All right, council member Stratton and then Kinnear and then Cathcart. I think that um, council member Mom really, really uh, did a great job explaining how I'm feeling about this tonight, but I wanted to add that as frustrating as this has been for many, many people, um, it, it feels like I, I, that I need to say thank you to the OPO and the OPO commission and that office because as frustrated as we got and as guild, the guild got, they were just as frustrated. And what I saw change was um, uh, uh, a group, groups of people that wanted the same thing but couldn't get there. And watching everybody kind of come around a table and talk it out, this isn't perfect. Um, I respect the R.L. Budsman, and I think that um, he is willing to, to make this work and work through these things. So I, I just want to thank everybody because it, it was a long, hard road, and especially the LPO, the LPO Commission, because this is what our citizens wanted. This is what we need to give them, and we need to work very hard with the police department to make sure that all comes together properly. So thank you to everybody. All right. I think I saw Council Member Kinnear next and then Council Member Cathcart. Thank you. And I would echo both of uh, Council Member Mom and Stratton's uh, voices on this. I do want to thank SBD for their patience. I think every neighborhood council meeting I went to, there was a police officer there. They'd look at me and say, when are you going to pass our contract? And that went on for years. And I looked at them and said, we don't have anything to pass. The administration hasn't given us anything. It was a long, rocky path to get to this point. Some people are going to say, as we heard tonight, we didn't do enough. And some will say this goes too far. I believe it's the correct balance. And I commend council president for being at the table and hammering this out with the guild and mayor. The gifts of listening and being responsive to others' needs and desires help craft the end product. So thank you, Council President. I also commend the Guild to be open to listening and considering our concerns. And I know that was difficult. Um, we're not that far apart, as it turns out. So that long way of saying I support this contract. Thank you, Council Member Cathcart. Yeah, thank you. I, I just want to thank uh, the mayor and council president, your uh, uh, leadership at the negotiating table, as well as that of, of staff and, and frankly, the guild. It's been said a few times tonight, but I, I think it's just really important to point out that they've obviously taken a, a big step towards uh, a big idea that, that has a lot of unknowns for them. And, and that's, that's huge. So I'm really grateful that all the parties were able to come together and, and find a result that that meets, I think, at last the spirit of what's in the, the charter uh, regarding independent oversight. And I'm really grateful that I have the opportunity to vote tonight both uh, to help implement that oversight, but also to support our officers. And, you know, it's been four years going on, going on five this year uh, since our officers have had a contract. And hopefully we'll avoid that again in the future. Uh, but I think, you know, we've been able to, to come around this idea that 70% of voters in the city, 67% in my district back in 2013 said that they wanted. And I think it's really important that we see that to fruition. And I think tonight we finally make that, take that step. And that's really important. So I'm, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to vote for this, support our officers, get them the pay that they very much deserve, and also get the oversight implemented, uh, start getting it implemented. Uh, to ensure that, that we do have that, that independent uh, accountability in our city. So thank you again to everybody who's helped to get us to this point and uh, look forward to supporting this. Councilmember Burke. Thank you. And as everybody can see, uh, there's a lot of thanks to be given tonight for all the hard work that people have done. I uh, just want to echo this process has been way better than the last process that I went through. We actually had input and 
uh, a lot of our suggestions were taken and, and I felt like our body was heard really well during this process. So uh, I, you know, I am definitely going to be supporting this tonight, but I just am still, because I feel like we are moving in the right direction. This gets us uh, with a little bit of police oversight and um, this is what the community wanted. It's been far too long since they've been able to observe this. Um, but let us not forget that we were just walking the streets um, last summer and looking for police reform and to reevaluate our budget and uh, go through those processes. And um, I'm a little disheartened that we haven't had any of those conversations. We haven't moved forward on any sort of reforms or looking, diving into our budget to see where we can um, negotiate different um, tactics that we can take and things like that. So. I just really, um, I want, you know, our administration, mayor, and um, our city council body to be really proud of us doing this negotiation during a really stressful time. Um, but I really don't want to forget about um, all of the people who have died uh, in this process. And there's no accountability on the officers right now. And we are working at state level changes, but it really also has to be local here. And um, I just want to honor what our constituents were saying this last summer in their emails and what they want and what they're looking for in the future. And that's on us. And so I hope that we can actually start these conversations, get something going and actually work on some real um, thorough policy that's going to make our all of our community members feel safe. So, um, but thank you everybody for all your work on this. and. It was a delight to be part of this process and um, really learn the nitty gritty of, of how the ombudsman works. So um, thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Wilkerson. Thank you, Council President Biggs. I, I want to echo the thanks uh, to all the leadership that was at the table. But I have to acknowledge the pain on both sides from our officers and the community of how long it's taken. Is this a perfect contract? No, but I know that we're all ready to move forward. As you know, we'll be going to contract negotiations again in a couple of months, which will reset the clock or a new beginning to have more input to what Council Member Perth just talked about, the reforms we want to see, how we reimagine Spokane, and other people that are at the table. So it is a whole wide community effort. So again, thank you. I will be voting yes a year, well, last year, uh, we all voted no, but tonight I'm voting yes because we have to start this process going forward together. And thank you again to everyone, Council President Bakes and Mayor, for your leadership and for the guild stepping up. I, I appreciate that. That was a learning curve for me as a new council member. So it's great to hear from everybody. I, I have a few words, probably more than the rest of you, just because this issue has been uh, dear to my heart for a long time. Time. I'm thinking back, it's been 14 years since the Office of Police Ombudsman was first proposed. 14 years. And even after a couple years that it was put in place, uh, we got what we called Ombuds Light because it was the middle of a police contract. And the mayor at the time said, you know, you can't get what you really want yet because it's the middle of a contract, but the next contract will get it. And that didn't happen. So the voters came together in 2013 with the assistance and support of a previous city council and had a ballot in, uh, in the matter. And they passed what they considered independent civilian oversight using an ombuds model. And as has already been said, it passed with 69% approval. And yet that was eight years ago, last month. And we're just now getting close to it. So people have been waiting a long time to get what seemed to make sense. And the thing that I want people to know is that when we back in 2007 were exploring and we looked all over the state and really the region to come up with something that could help our police department and our community heal and come together, we chose the ombuds model intentionally. It wasn't a model that would actually uh, change discipline for an officer. It was meant to give citizens access and community members access to the process, not to have to go downtown. Uh, to the police precinct to make a complaint. You could do it in a safe place. And then secondly, to give a window of light into what happened 
and to hear what happened and see what happened from an independent voice, a law enforcement professional, but working for the community. And third, to get a closing report that would tell us how we could prevent harm in the future. That was the, the dream and the idea of ombuds. And we just thought with that much sunlight and that much access and good uh, harm reduction proposals, we would get better and better and better. Unfortunately, that first contract that was just kind of a partial stayed in place too long, and we didn't get as much as we wanted. We got a lot over time. Things have really progressed, but we didn't get really what we wanted. And when you look at our charter that talks about independent investigation, it says independent investigation within the context of existing state law. And that has been the challenge ever since we passed it in every negotiation, is that there are some pretty uh, substantial state laws that get in the way of civilian oversight. And it has to do with what's a daily working condition and what impacts discipline. And we have wrestled and wrestled and wrestled with that until this contract, I believe, finally gives it to us. And what it means is this, is that the model that we've chosen and worked out with the police and with the community is that if a complaint is made, the ombuds gets full access to the entire investigation. They get to participate in real time. They can ask any question of any witness. They can see any video, any document. They can act independently within the police investigation. And what's different now is that uh, if the police want to stop the investigation or not even do one in the first place, the ombuds now has a clear path. Simply write down what he or she wants to do submit it to the chief, and if the chief won't do it with the ombuds in participating, it goes to the ombuds commission, and if the commission authorizes it, then the ombuds office can fully investigate independently. So either with the department, they can do it independently, or if the department stops, they can still do it. And at the end, they can now issue closing reports. Until recently, well, still in the existing contract, the only closing report could be was it timely investigation, a thorough and objective? They couldn't tell us what they thought, what they learned from the witnesses, what they saw on the video. They couldn't do that. Under this agreement, they can. They can tell us what they think. Now, it's not a judge saying it. It's not even on behalf of the city. It's just an independent person on our behalf as a community, representing the community, to tell us what happened. And then finally, to tell us what could be different going forward. What policy should we change? What training should we change? How can we reduce harm going forward? So at least when there is a tragedy, we can improve from it. That's the ombuds model. There are other models. There are models where civilians sit on the board that disciplines officers or not. And I'm convinced that those aren't the best models, but we, we could pursue that. But that is not our model. But we are finally fleshed out uh, the charter's promise, I believe, within existing state law. Uh, the other thing that we get in this particular contract is a serious uh, expansion. It used to be we could only investigate uh, serious matters that would lead to termination or demotion or suspension. Now any police investigation, even if it's just a shift investigation, the ombuds can participate to the degree that they want to. We also expanded by now having a deputy ombuds person who has all the powers of the ombuds. And so we can be two places at once now. And finally, one of the biggest complaints about the last version of the proposed contract is that we don't have interference with the ombuds duties. So no arbitrator can uh, fire the ombuds or discipline or get rid of an ombuds commission member. Only the commission can fire or discipline the ombuds and only the city council can remove or discipline an ombuds commission member. That's preserved. So I really appreciate that we have all those things. There are things that need to change probably at the legislature to get more independence of what people want. And those bills are at the legislature. I wanted to do two more things. I want to talk about some next steps. But I really wanted to give a key to what I thought was important of why this worked. And that was deep listening, individual to individual. Sometimes we listen so that we can argue back. But other times we listen so that we can understand. And without going into the confidential matters of the negotiation, that was my experience, was deep listening. I heard from officers of what their fears were about what the citizens wanted. 
they heard from me on behalf of the citizens what the citizens wanted and the community members wanted. And the mayor was listening. Our legal counsel was listening. Everyone was listening. And then we also included, near the end of the process, the ombuds office and the commissioners. And we found out what they wanted and incorporated as much of that. But what I really want to note, and sometimes we forget, is how important the community was in this. We have been listening to the community for years, and the community has been listening to the people who have been broken in this system. And they have tenaciously advocated for the full embodiment of the charter and for civilian oversight using an ombuds model. And there are dozens and dozens of individuals who have told their stories, who have marched, who have spoken at our council meetings, who have emailed us, who have called us, and they have continued to stay active since 2007. And we would not be here without that pressure. And I just want to commend that community and hope that you continue to call out the vision you wanted. Finally, there's some next steps. There is a guild vote. The guild will be voting after we vote tonight. There are going to be some ordinance changes. So we have to incorporate the changes in the contract, but it's also an opportunity to strengthen the ombuds office and make sure that they feel supported by the city. And just because they have independent authority, they are no less city employees in a city department and deserve the same support as we do. The legislature needs to continue to act, and there are several bills, as I mentioned. And more importantly, we have future conversations with the police and the community to finish the process we started in 2007, which was heal the relationship between police officers and the community they work for. And I look forward to that, and I appreciate all the work and all the hours that so many of you I see on the screen have put in and thought, and all the times you listen to me rail against things. And I appreciate your confidence, uh, Mayor and Council members, and I'm so pleased that we are here tonight and that we are here together. And with that, We'll have a roll call. Council Member Mum. Aye. Council Member Stratton. Aye. Council Member Kinnear. Aye. Council President and aye. Council Member Burke. Aye. Council Member Cathcart. Aye. Council Member Wilkerson. Aye. All right. That is seven to zero. Um, Madam Mayor, I provide you a 7-0 vote, and thank you again to everyone, the police guild, the ombuds, all the people, all the council members, and the city of Spokane. And with that, we're going to take a five-minute recess at 6.55. We'll reconvene at 7 o'clock to take up a potential second special matter. So I'll see you in just a few minutes. We'll keep the meeting live. I'm just going to turn off my microphone, but...
what? Okay. <laughs> All right. So we're going to go back on, and then we're going to go to open form. Okay? All right. All right, I'm going to bring us back into session. And for those of you who are watching that briefing, we've been talking about a letter about um, vaccines. And we had discussed um, possibly adding it right now. I talked to Councilmember Cathcart, who's uh, the main author. He's made several different versions in response to Councilmember um, proposals. Um, but we still quite haven't got unanimity, so he's agreed to put that off for a week so we'll do that thank you council member cathcart for all the work so far and people and um, that will bring us um i believe we don't have any more i'm checking one more yep one more text to make sure that i hadn't forgotten anything so we're going to go to open forum and again if you are watching and not on the phone please get on the phone otherwise you'll miss your chance and the people that I have uh, signed up on Open Forum right now are Nicolette Ockeltree, uh, Drea Gallardo, uh, and Elisa Johnson. And then potentially I have these other folks, Hansel Sanchez, Anna Trusty, Fernanda Masco, and Ryan Louie. Uh, apologies if I'm not getting people's names right. So if you're one of those people, hang on and we'll invite you to push three in your turn. But right now and again just a reminder for open forum uh you have three minutes and uh i i i used to interrupt and tell you you had 30 seconds left but i'm i found that kind of jarring so i'm gonna wait till three minutes but if i tell you three minutes is up i appreciate if you would wind it up and uh, feel free to time yourself so you know how your time's going because we don't have a timer that you can see in real time um and with that nicolette if you want to hit star three All right, Nicolette, go ahead and introduce yourself again, and you have up to three minutes. Good evening, Council. Uh, a year ago, we met in person for the March 2nd, 2020 City Council meeting. You may remember there was standing room only. You may also remember uh, that the... Uh, that a preacher named Greg Locke from Tennessee flew into Spokane to give testimony in support of the religious group, the Church at Planned Parenthood, who protested outside of Planned Parenthood, and that the pastor who started PCAP, Ken Peters, also spoke. So did many community members who were against these protests that were happening outside of Planned Parenthood, and I'm very grateful that you all passed uh, the ordin ordinance that uh, Councilwoman Kinnear put forward that harmonized the city and state codes, giving the police more authority to enforce it and codifying a private right of action for citizens to sue protesters who disrupted their access to health care. Since then, a lot has happened. The city has shut down from COVID. Uh, the protests at Planned Parenthood continued to happen um, in defiance of the governor's shutdown orders, of course, and they've it's happened uh, since. Uh, Planned Parenthood is now suing the church at Planned Parenthood, and they have moved across the street to try to comply from a, an injunction or to comply with an injunction uh, by a judge. Now, I do want to mention that these two pastors I, I mentioned earlier, Greg Locke and Ken Peters, uh, were two preachers that actually were invited to speak both the night before and the day of the insurrection in Washington, D.C. on January 6th. I mention this to highlight the fact that when activists come out and speak to you as concerned citizens like we have about these gentlemen and their connections with other individuals, we genuinely do it out of the compassion for our fellow uh, citizens, and we do it because we've done our homework on uh, why we think that these individuals and their conduct might create a, a danger. Uh, it turns out that, that we were right and that these individuals uh, were present um, at one of the darkest days in the United States uh, history. And uh, I just, I hope that in light of that, that you continue to listen to the citizens when we speak at Open Forum about our concerns. And I encourage you to continue to do things like 
you did um, on January, uh, excuse me, on March uh, 2nd of last year, which is passed legislation to pre protect citizens uh, based on community responses that you've heard and needs that you see to keep our citizens safe. Thank you. Thank you. And if you want to hit star three and lower your hand, and then uh, Andrea Rose Gallardo, if you would like to hit star three. Not seeing Drea. Um, how about Alyssa Johnson? All right, Ms. Johnson, uh, go ahead and introduce yourself. You have up to three minutes. Hi, uh, my name is Alyssa. I am a graduate student at Eastern Washington University, and I am working with an advocacy group for low-income grocery store workers. While large grocers have profited during the pandemic, their employees have continuously put their health at risk without compensation. Unlike many of the higher paying jobs, our grocery store workers have not had the luxury of getting paid to work from home and avoid exposure to COVID-19. These workers, our neighbors and friends who were already in financial binds prior to the pandemic, go to work every day and put themselves and their families at risk of getting COVID and really have no choice to miss or quit their jobs because they simply can't afford to. It's likely that one missed day of pay could result in not being able to pay rent or provide food for their families. They have been treated like pawns in a game, when not that long ago, the media and their employers were referring to them as heroes of the pandemic. There is action that can be taken now to provide relief to those risking their health so that we can continue to stock our pantries and feed our families. A few of our local workers who chose to remain anonymous, wanted to weigh in. When asked about working conditions, one worker stated, I can't go to work and feel safe. I feel stuck. Customers can be brutal and no one follows the tape or safety policies. When asked what hazard pay would do for them, one worker stated, I might actually be able to afford to take a sick day or two if the time came. Another said, I could maybe save some to go back to school instead of spending it all on bills and finally get a job where I don't have to worry and stress as much every single month. But right now, it's all I have to provide for my kids. Hazard pay ordinances through June of 2021 that targets larger grocery store corporations must be taken into consideration to show appreciation and relieve our community members that are being impacted by the pandemic the most. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. And uh, next, I'm going to just go through these names one at a time to see if you're on the line. Uh, Hansel Sanchez, hit star three if you're there. Yep. All right. Um, go ahead and introduce yourself. You have up to three minutes. Good evening. My name is Hansel Sanchez, and I'm a dreamer. I moved from Orlando, Florida to Spokane about five years ago looking for better opportunities. But when I say opportunities, I don't mean handouts, but opportunities where one could grow and contribute to society without so many barriers. For me, that was cool. I moved to Spokane with the hopes of finally getting my bachelor's degree in women and gender studies at Eastern Washington University. At first, I didn't like Spokane. I thought it lacked diversity. Mind you, I was coming from Orlando, Florida, so of course, I noticed the change, especially the food. If you visited Orlando, you know what I mean. I kept studying hard, and in one of my classes, I learned about the sexual call hotline for Spokane and how they were needing volunteers to help. A spark ignited within me, and I signed up for it. It is often by serving the one find the community, a home. Working on the hotline allowed me to be there for survivors, survivors of different races, but it also opened my eyes to the lack of culturally responsive services in Spokane. I shared my concern with my family, friends, professors, and pastors, and with their help, I founded NIA, Mujeres in Action, an nonprofit organization that today provides culturally responsive services to survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. Of course, my plans to leave Spokane after graduation were postponed. I have found my calling, my place in this city. Today, I'm the director for NIA, working full-time, and we have three other people on staff. I'm not much for bragging, but we immigrants have helped create something amazing in Spokane. We're making history making a path where there, where, where there wasn't any, 
building bridges between communities, creating jobs. And my story is not that unique. Find an immigrant and you will find hardworking people. My husband is also an immigrant. He thinks he's spoken with no, nothing but dreams, hope, and God's favor. And now we have our home. My husband is a business owner. He helps create jobs, too, with his house banking company. I have a sister who's a caregiver, caring for the most vulnerable in this time. My dad is a business owner as well. He's a mechanic. I could go on and talk about my family and what they do and how they each play a part to make our communities better. Our stories represent the thousands of immigrants living in Spokane. We struggle, but we keep working hard. We're not takers. On the contrary, we're givers. In these trying times, we immigrants have helped hold our city together. I like to think that the city of Spokane can return the favor and also help support hardworking, tax-paying immigrant families. Will the city of Spokane stand with us and for us? After all, aren't we all immigrants? Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for sharing tonight and all that you've accomplished. Um, next, I, let me, oh, that's right. Well, wait a second. Okay, Anna Trusty, or Anna Trusty, if you want to hit star three. All right, go ahead and introduce yourself. You have up to three minutes. Thank you. My name is Anna Trusty. The past year has highlighted many existing inequities in our government and social systems. We've heard terms like systematic racism, and we might have repeated it so often that it kind of loses its meaning. But I have been trying to understand more of it, and the more I learn, the more I believe we owe it to future generations to work together in dismantling the systems that have harvested these inequities. Another catchphrase that can easily lose its meaning when we lack the knowledge of the history behind it is the saying that if we don't learn from history, we are bound to repeat it. I really never understood it as clearly as to when I learned that the Nazis studied the U.S. and its treatment of black people during the embarrassing historical period in which the U.S. enslaved blacks, an arbitrary decision based on white supremacy. This past Wednesday, February 24th, during a Housing Action Subcommittee meeting, where part of the invitation read as follows. The scope of this group is broader than affordable housing. Broad strategic areas currently include equity lens to prioritize investment to achieve equitable outcomes. It went on, but that is the part I want to highlight. I thought those in the meeting understand the importance of access to affordable housing for all. Unfortunately, during this meeting, one of our city council members suggested that community members that pay taxes using ITIN numbers instead of socials be excluded from the equitable lens and thus prioritize the people of Spokane. And I say that in quotation marks. We all make up Spokane. No one of us holds any more value than the next. Whether the government identifies us with a social or an item number, our contribution to the community is just as valuable. Stable housing for hardworking people will enable any member of our community that pays taxes to establish a strong foundation for their families. These are families that live in Spokane, learn alongside our children in Spokane schools from Spokane teachers, work in Spokane, and engage in our Spokane community. So I would easily say they are the people of Spokane. The way we treat them is the way they will learn to treat us. The hate you give is what is harvested in return. Do we want to base our equity and diversity programs on excluding the historically appropriate group of our time? Or can we learn from history and not repeat the same mistakes? ITIN numbers, socialist security numbers, are an arbitrary number socially constructed to separate those that have just entered the country from those that entered a couple of generations back. How can we as a community grow into being kind, equitable, when we are ready to keep repeating the same past mistakes? What statues should we build to remind us to be kind and inclusive to our brothers and sisters that just like you and just like me, strive to, for a better life liberty and the pursuit of happiness thank you for your time thank you uh next fernanda mazco hit star three all right and i apologize if i didn't pronounce your name correctly but go ahead and introduce yourself and you have up to three minutes hello my name is fernanda mazco 
And I just want to express my concern with some of the language being used by certain um, city council members. As a community organizer and Latino advocate, I've been working very hard to increase the trust between the Latino community and government and city officials. Immigrants, regardless of their status, I myself am an immigrant. I'm a citizen, but nevertheless, I'm an immigrant. First generation college graduate. So any immigrant should be seen and respected as community members of Spokane. Not only do we live here, but we contribute to the economic, social, and cultural vitality of the city of Spokane. We call ourselves Spokaneites. We say we are inclusive, we're welcoming. Well, then I expect better from city council members. We are trying to develop a trusted relationship with our immigrant community and our city officials. We cannot do this alone. We need you by your side. And that's just, uh, that's just all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to try one more time for Andrea Rose Gallardo. Hit star three if you're there. All right. Then uh, Ryan Louie. Ryan is there. Hit star three. All right. Ryan, go ahead and introduce yourself. You have up to three minutes. Hi, and thank you for your time, council members. Uh, my name is Ryan Louie. My pronouns are they and them. I am speaking tonight on behalf of the Spokane Coalition of Color as a descendant of Chinese immigrants and as someone part of the LGBTQ plus community. I was in a meeting last Wednesday with several others on this call, including council members and members of our BIPOC community. And what was said about the exclusion of certain types of people really angered me at first, and it took me a long time to really tackle what was really happening because it wasn't just anger, it was hurt. And this type of rhetoric that enforces white supremacy and classism is violent towards people, not just the BIPOC community, but towards everybody. And I find it interesting that the things the BIPOC community are asking for such as equity, safety, and inclusivity are very similar to what y'all were talking about with the police contract. One of the things I heard from council member Mum was being the, the council being part of the conversation and some of you were left out. And I think you understand that when it comes to making decisions where you're addressing a population that you're serving, they need to be a part of that conversation. So when we're moving forward with Ordinance 1590 and creating a, an advisory committee, there, I hope that the representation of the people you're serving really shows up in those committees. Um, Council Member Kinnear, you said that, and I think it was you, that the police were asking you every time they saw you when are you going to help us? When are you going to give us a new contract? The BIPOC community in Spokane is asking our council members, when are you going to properly represent us? And we keep asking you that. And Ordinance 1590 does include language around equity and inclusion, but right up, it hasn't even started yet, and we've already been excluded verbally. Um, and I... Um, Council President Beggs, you talked about the ombudsman model of preventing harm. The way you prevent harm in our community, in our BIPOC community, is to include us and make us feel like we're welcome. I was in a conversation with Council Member Wilkerson months ago on the multi-ethnic business um, enterprise, and they asked business, multi-ethnic business organizations what can we do to help serve your community? Because Spokane seems to be lacking diversity and larger companies Ryan, are going elsewhere because we don't have proper representation. Get, you're at the end of your it's three minutes. It's important. Okay. Well, I'm almost done here. Um, 
Wow. There's a way for us to all be included to increase diversity in Spokane. And Mayor Woodward, you mentioned that you were Ryan, able to try something really, new with a police ombudsman. You're contract. well over. So come back and talk to us in a week and continue that. But you're you're well over. And I, if I let one person do that, then I, I have to do that. But I appreciate your words tonight coming down. Please come back and finish sharing your concerns with us. Um, that's the end of public forum for this evening. That's the end of our business. Our next city council meeting is this Thursday at 11, study session, and then we'll be back at our committee meeting next Monday afternoon at 1.15, briefing at 3.30, and legislative uh, session at 6. Thanks, everyone, for your participation on the meeting tonight. Thanks for those who are watching at home. Please be kind to each other, and if you can, help someone nearby. We're adjourned. Thanks for using WebEx.